Hello again, everyone. We are now going to move into a, a wonderful discussion, a roundtable discussion with a, a fantastic group of people. Um, I am just going to introduce the moderators who will then introduce our speakers and discussants. We have Miriam Connor, who is the founder of Creative Policy um, and is also an artist fellow with Planet Texas 2050. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> and we have Dr. Catherine Liebernecht, who is an assistant professor in community and regional planning in the School of Architecture. Yeah, there's more. <laughs> and the co and the co-lead of the Equitable and Regenerative Cities in a Post-Carbon Future flagship project and the original chair of Planet Texas 2050. And that's enough. <laughs> Take it away. Is this working? It is. Great. Oh, thank you all so much for being oh, cut out for being here and for listening. Um, I'm really excited for this panel. I was just actually reflecting on those early Planet Texas 2050 days earlier this morning because I got to see Tessa Green and we were reminiscing. And I really think that the topic we're speaking about today in, in this panel and the discussants supporting community preparedness and resilience in Austin. Um, I just can't think of a better panel topic to really represent the depth of research and pr engaged practice that Planet Texas 2050 has been trying to do over the past five years in terms of community engaged research, working collaboratively with partners across different sectors, doing research that matters, um, involving cultural institutions. So um, I'm really looking forward to this rich discussion. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to introduce our panelists and our discussants. I have a few just quick comments to make myself too, and then Miriam is going to speak for about five minutes, and then we'll move into our panel. Um, but today, and I'll just kind of move down this way and then come back up this way. <laughs> um, in addition to Miriam and myself, we have Mia Greer, who's with Community Coalition for Health and is also a fellow through that flagship project through Planet Texas 2050 that Heidi was just speaking about. Um, we also have Jessica Jones, who's with the city of Austin slash hybrid a little bit UT Austin as well, and a graduate of UT Austin, and Dave Miyogi, who's a professor here at UT Austin as well. And then we also have discussants this way, Patrick Bixler, also at UT Austin, assistant professor at LBJ School, Mark Coudere, now at the Office of Resilience of City Austin, on loan from the Office of Sustainability, mm -hmm. and Janice Lookout from Community Resilience Trust and founder of the Earth Day events here in Oh, and thank you. And Julia, I knew I was going to forget because <laughs> I'm so present in this room. And we're so delighted that Julia Drapkin uh, is joining us to speak about her project, I See Change, as well. So that is our full panel and discussants for today. Um, and I really want to let, make sure they have the airtime. I will just say briefly, as Mary and I met a couple times to prepare for this panel, we were speaking about how we got involved in this, this work, kind of broadly defined, of community preparedness, disaster response recovery. And I was really kind of reflecting that, for me, I think my story is that I grew up here in Austin, in Southwest Austin. Our backyard went directly into Williamson Creek. Um, and to me, that was a real amenity. I spent a lot of time in my childhood playing there and enjoying kind of the creek in the woods. Uh, didn't live here for a couple decades. Moved back 10 years ago. We were just emerging from that record-setting drought. And then the next year, in 2013, Onion Creek flooded. And four people died, and I just remember thinking, how is this possible in such a high capacity city like Austin that when it rains, sometimes people die, sometimes people drown? And my work as an environmental planner focusing on equity um, kind of connected to climate adaptation work, but I hadn't done that much in that field and increasingly started to work more thinking about how communities prepare for the increasing fre frequency and um, amplification of these climate related events. And you know, through that work, had a lot of amazing support and collaboration, working with Planet Texas 2050 colleagues and partners who are here today represented it. Um, so that's a little bit how I got involved. I do want to mention, though, I think on a personal level, the reason why I, I really center a lot of my thinking around preparedness every day is just as a parent, thinking about my own kids and the difficult or challenging situations, sometimes traumatic, that they have experienced, how Mostly they recover from them, move forward. And just thinking about how, for me, preparedness is making sure our loved ones, broadly defined, um, are safe. And I, I look forward to that conversation today um, with all of you. So thanks, Miriam. Thank you. So I just wanted to 
talk about. <laughs> um, so where I came from, how did I get in this work? I started off, well, first I came here to Austin when I was three. I got my BFA in California for photography. And then from there, I moved back to Austin and left all my books, my clothes, and I was like, I love Austin. I want to help take care of Austin. Didn't know I was actually going to help take care of the Austinites. Um, but I've served on the African American Quality of Life Commission. I am also on the Board of Preservation Austin. I have done community engagement for about seven years or more. And that's with Six Square. I was the first black cultural, let's, Six Square is the Black Cultural District of Austin. And I was the first curator and program manager. And then I've also worked with Forklift Dance Works. Some of y'all saw them talk yesterday. They're an amazing creative dance group. Um, and then I started working with Public City doing arts-based community engagement. And now I've co-founded my own practice, um, starting from the community up, helping advocacy, and now uh, disaster relief, as well as doing community engagement. But during um, Yuri, the first day, it was fun. It was great. Walking around my neighborhood, walked all the way downtown. It was like it's snowing. This is amazing. Then uh, while downtown, I we found a jacket that was on top of snow. And having to go check on what I didn't know was a jacket, I was like, this could be, like I've never put myself or there been in a situation where I'd have to check on another human being to see if they were alive or dead. And so after that, my friend, Sarita Davis, sent me a link to CRT, which Jane has co-founded. And ever since then, I've been in disaster relief. Um, I've done events for the past 10 years, and I see that community disaster response is all events. It is basically planning a gigantic festival that depends on like the, but the thing that's on stake, it's not fun, it's the people's lives are at stake. And that, yeah, that's the pathway that I've taken now. Um, but with that, I'm gonna introduce Mia um, because you have some more personal stories that are absolutely phenomenal and yeah, so thank you. Testing? Yeah. Ah, I don't hear me, so I guess you do. Um, I'm Mia Greer. Um, I am the CEO of Community Coalition for Health. And um, we started in this path of helping um, with a diabetes program. And because of the diabetes program, um, we learned a lot about Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas is a wonderful place to live. It is one of the best places to live in Austin until you are facing a challenge. Austin is, it just sucks when you're facing a challenge. When you need help, is there anyone that I can see? Am I safe? How can I get help? Um, what, how, why do I feel this way? Nobody wants to help me. Um, what, I, I'm hungry. <laughs> Why is this not, why is it so hot? That's something I had to learn when I got here um, from Michigan is what in the world it felt like the sun was on my shoulder and we don't have, and, and we don't have air conditioning in Michigan. You open the windows. Well, opening the windows here is just letting more of the sun in, right? Um, so Austin is a great place and, and new people. I've never seen this before. Old people, when we had Yuri, we never saw that before. We never saw that before. So when you're in Austin and you're a community member, you've never saw this before, and you are having a crisis or you have something going on if the, if the environment, if Yuri comes, as a individual, you're like, do I reach out for help? Can I reach out for help in Austin? Being, and I'll say this is personal, being an African-American female with grandchildren and her children, um, who's also had a background in the criminal justice system, um, who committed a crime, 
uh, the climate has disrupted. What do I do? I feel like I'm by myself. I feel like if I tell anybody I need money, they're gonna say, well, is she gonna steal it because she has a, she has a criminal background? Um, are, I need health issues. Well, what did you do? What kind of job did you have? do you have that you don't have health care? We are in a city where there's so many things that are um, available to some and not available to all, especially during a crisis. Um, during a crisis, we tend to hoard, which is, um, I, I think, a good word. Um, we hoard. Um, I was just talking to someone earlier about how we have to collude to get some things as a community, that we have to secretly try and take some things back because we are we're sitting here saying, how do I get help? I'm by myself. But community and economic development can be described as the process of managing the fluidity of collaborate, collaborative development within the specific context. So when we all gather around that person that is wondering how can we get help, this is the only way we can do it. We have to come together as a community. And then not only as a community, we have to know what that personal issue is. What is going on in that community that makes them feel the way that they felt, that they feel isolated? Um, during URI, I'm one of those people that, I was like, I'm not leaving my house. But I had to have somebody who had the, the audacity to step up to me and say, you're leaving. You're, be, for the health of the community, we need you healthy. For the health of the community, we need you well. For the health of the community, we can't have you die in your house that went down to 19 degrees. So as a community, they wrapped themselves around me. We developed collaborative, we developed collaboration among, and it so happens to be our church. Our church collaborated. We called everyone. We made sure everybody was where they were supposed to be or safe. We put all of our resources together. <laughs> But what, could, what we found out is we couldn't get the help from outside. That great Austin that I showed you earlier, we didn't get any of that help, which is sad. Austin has the availability to help. That's why I'm really excited about this hub program because that is what we're gonna do. We're gonna scan the inter, inter, internal environment for changes needed. Assess regular occurrences. We're starting to understand that this crazy stuff that's going on is not just crazy stuff that's going on. It's stuff that's going to happen. It's a regular thing now. We need to, we need to not think that there, it's once in a generation. It's once in every 100 years. Now it's coming all the time. Tonight we have something going on that now, I, I got an email from Janice that said, what are we going to do about these people? I'm like, girl, I don't know what we're going to do about these people, but we should have something to do about these people, right? And Shelf life of decisions is short. This is one of my favorite. It's because what happened yesterday and what we did yesterday does not work for tomorrow. Does not work for the next crisis. It does not work for Mia. It may not work for the community I'm in. It may not work for Travis. It may not work for Austin proper, city of Austin, but it may work for Mainer. So we have to know that the shelf life of decisions is short. We always have to move quickly. We have to think different. We have to come up with different things and we can't get stuck. Um, we always have to move and decide this worked yesterday, but it may not work tomorrow. Thank you. Next, we've got Jessica Jones. Hard to follow. Oh. It's hard to follow Mia. Can you hear me? Okay. Is it working? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Hold it closer. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, but my name is Jessica, and I have the opportunity to serve in this dual role that is half UT Austin and half City of Austin. And today I'll be giving a very brief presentation on. Resilience hubs, what they are looking like in Austin, and what they look like on a national scale. So real quickly, our work is, uh, we frame our work with these equity guiding principles here in Austin that were co-created by a community task force. 
And so every time we talk about resilience hubs, whether it's internally with other city departments, our county agencies, or our external community partners, we always bring this to the forefront to remember that in our work, we wanna acknowledge systems and history of inequity. We wanna center community voices and community narratives. Are we cultivating trust and equity through community-driven decision-making? People power, are we centering those that are most impacted by shocks and disruptions and stressors? And accountability and transparency. Are we bridging the divide between community and the city? As Mia said, uh, things are getting crazier and crazier on a regular basis, and this is no shock to this, to this crowd, but right, uh, uh, shocks and stressors are becoming more frequent, are becoming more intense. We know that those most disadvantaged uh, face the brunt of these disruptions and disasters, and it was really Winter Storm Uri here in the city of Austin that was kind of the pinnacle event um, to quote Mark from earlier, uh, kind of the urgency of emergency uh, that really brought up the idea of creating resilience hubs here in Austin and having a chief resilience officer and creating an office of resilience. So really from that major event, we get the office of resilience, we get this pilot program to co-create with the community six pilot resilience hubs here in Austin and start brainstorming and creating together what is a resilience hub, what does the community want, um, and what could it look like, and what kind of services could it provide. So when I talk about resilience hubs, this is also a very important slide in our narrative, ongoing narrative, about what is a resilience hub here in Austin and what is it not. So in our current co-creation stage, resilience hubs here in Austin are existing physical facilities. So we're not building anything new from scratch. In fact, our six pilot hubs are all recreation centers here in Austin. So they are pre, they're existing sites, um, they're community focused already. They're providing a lot of services and the folks who work at these sites know their communities really, really well. They are also, what we're working on is to create these safe spaces before and after emergency events. And this is ongoing in the creation and the role of a resilience hub of what can it uh, provide before an emergency. So thinking about preparedness, about training, about resources, uh, maybe it's a warming center, maybe it's a cooling center, and what can it help provide for that recovery effort? And, and is it just programming that happens within the physical structure itself, or is it kind of radiating, radiating hub and spoke model from this physical facility? And really, um, it's the people who are the resilience hub in the community. What we say a resilience hub is not is that it's not a replacement for traditional emergency response and not every resilience hub can serve as an emergency shelter, but sometimes they can if they have the capacity. So it gets really confusing, <laughs> but uh, we are navigating what the role of a resilience hub can play and what we can adequately offer for the community. And so still navigating that space of during emergency event, what can a resilience hub do and provide? So when I started this position, one of my first key tasks was to get a broad scan of what resilience hubs look like nationwide. And what we see broadly is that resilience hubs nationwide are fitting that left-hand box more often. They're community-owned and community-operated facilities. So this is the most common resilience hub model that I've seen so far. And these are usually faith-based organizations or community-run org buildings, own sites. And what the city provides in this instance is kind of the conduit of information. So uh, providing resource information support to these already existing sites and kind of just elevating and enhancing already what 
pre-existing programming goes on. So maybe just elevating food distribution that is already occurring at these sites. What we're doing in Austin is we're on the other side of the spectrum. So we have chosen six agency-owned or city-owned and city-operated sites to kick off our pilot program. And this is an oddity <laughs> nationwide because uh, more of them tend to focus and kind of support community-owned sites. But what we're trying to do is to really uplift these existing city resources, enhance them, and really just um, create a, res a link of resilience hubs, knowing that the six are not gonna be the final six, right? They're not, we're not only gonna be limited to six sites, but eventually want, we wanna expand the resilience hub network here in Austin. And so I was brought on to also kind of crack the nut on this middle <laughs> phase or this hybrid between a city owned facility that is community owned and community, oper or community operated and that the community has access to. So when I say access, that could mean um, being able to design and run the programming, but it could also mean like this image shows, passing the keys on to a community org to help run programming at these sites. And what would it take uh, liability wise and vendor wise and screening wise for the city to actually be able to pass the keys over to the community? And so that is a very unique model that I don't think yet really exists anywhere else. Um, and so we're creating that together, that vision. We're looking at different models, um, ambassador programs, the like to see what, uh, what can we do to kind of uh, co-create that opportunity. Another thing I wanted to mention about resilience hubs nationwide is that some cities are building a brand new facility. So they're struggling to find the funding, they're, but they're really, really focused that in order to have a resilience hub, we need to build something brand new from scratch. And right, they're facing the barriers of getting all the funding together, designing, making sure it fits you know, to the T, all the latest green infrastructure that the building is hardened, that maybe it meets HUD guidelines for emergency sheltering. And so it's really interesting to see that model too of like, we, can, we don't have an existing resilience hub, we have to build something from scratch. While with our approach, we've noted that these existing recreation centers are already resilience hubs. Uh, but we're just, you know, like, how do we elevate and um, just help um, build up the programming and expand the programming at these sites and also have the community shape the programming at these sites to better fit their needs to support community resilience. And so just real quickly, I wanted to share some challenges and opportunities in our work. Uh, and not surprisingly, uh, building community trust and in tandem with that, facing ongoing climatic events is a major challenge in this work, right? Um, so just uh, with community facing the brunt of disaster, disaster after disaster, winter storm Mara, right? With people were left without power for six to 10 days, uh, lost wages, you name it. Constantly, we're going through these cycles where the community is um, stressed to the point they can't meet their basic needs, they can't stay home because home is no longer safe, and we just have brunt after brunt of disaster. And so to be a city employee or city staff and go out to the community and ask, what do you need? Help dream with us about resilience, right? We constantly have to um, make sure that we're not tone deaf to the community and that uh, we're supporting them and still defining what the Office of Resilience role is in recovery and in response. And so with Winter Storm Mara, for example, in kind of bridging this challenge, our office served as a conduit between the CRT, the Community Collaborative, and the Emergency Operations Center. And that was a really new role. Uh, and it had a lot of challenges, but there, it was a great just like opportunity to try to build the connection between 
the information that was coming from the emergency operations center and how to translate that into actionable and short sound bites that were easy to share with the community and then likewise elevate questions from the community back to the EOC. So that was a really unique role for the Office of Resilience to play in the emergency response arena. And I would say that's a tie to both of those bullet points of trying to rebuild community trust in the face of an emergency event. And then all, as well as just like being incorporated in the recovery efforts and thinking about like what kind of resources can we get out to the community. The other two, so navigating municipal silos, uh, not only do we engage with external community partners, but we also engage with a handful or variety of city departments. And there's so many challenges in that aspect of just engaging internally, right? You engage internally with city staff from various departments for months on end, and then they leave and you have to start the relationship again with somebody new from that department and start from ground zero. Or the folks that you have around the table aren't the folks who can actually bring that message up to leadership. And so months later, once you get to finally meet with leadership, they have no idea about what you're doing. And then finally, limited resources, right? This is not unique to the city of Austin. And just real quickly, for opportunities, um, we have broad interest in the community. We're addressing a community need. This was reported in the after action reports from Winter Storm Uri. Uh, we have innovative and intentional community engagement. I've never seen city staff before try so many different methods to bring community to the table and incorporate and elevate their voices and then innovative research su support. So a big shout out to Planet Texas 2050. I'm an example of an innovative research idea where I'm funded by an ILA to support this. So both the city and the university came together to support Resilience Hub uh, research through this role that I now occupy. So just a huge shout out to everybody in this room, the Brain Trust, because you're the ones who help move this work forward. So with that, thank you. Nope. Yep. I have a light. I can hear you. <laughs> um, okay. We're. I, thank you so much, Jess. We're going to move to Julia Kamari Drapkin, who's going to speak about IC change. Um, joining us virtually. Thank you so much, Julia. Thanks so much. I'm going to share my screen and let me know if you can hear me. I hope it's not too. Um, Noisy where I am. Um, let's see. Um, it's sharing whiteboard. Hold on a second. <laughs> Good. Hold on a second. There. Can you see that? Yep. Yes. Cool. All right. Well, thank you all for this invitation and especially to Mia and Jessica for your presentations. I wish I could be there with you all in the room, but I'm certainly looking forward to the discussions of our challenges and our opportunities. So, again, I'm Julia Kamari Drapkin, the founder of IC Change. Um, for 15 years, I worked for media outlets across the world covering climate change, so the Associated Press and BBC, you know, and newspapers, local newspapers, reporting on climate science and natural disasters. So I covered the Asian tsunami and Hurricane Katrina in the same year. And over and over, um, I saw the same problem, many of which you guys are talking about today, um, that top-down, well-intentioned solutions are failing to meet and keep pace with local climate and infrastructure needs. So I'm going to talk about a solution for using a data-driven collaboration tool that solves for this problem, but in the process is activating everyday people to address climate change, modeling reliability and civic engagement for better infrastructure. But I'm going to first talk to you a little bit more why it matters. Of course, we know that climate change is coming at us and impacting our most vulnerable community members. And we have this once-in-a-lifetime infrastructure opportunity right here in the United States that just even looking at infrastructure on a global level, um, we spend $5 trillion on infrastructure every year, and not only is that investment increasingly at risk from climate change, there are critical risks that are undermining these opportunities to solve for it. According to the G20, uh, one out of five public projects um, are canceled or delayed because of environmental or social concerns in the community. So, for example, Miami Beach's attempt to raise local roads in response to sea level rise has resulted in four years worth of delays and lawsuits to stop the effort entirely. So why is this happening? Our climate information feedback loops between the public, 
our cities and solutions designers, even the most well-intentioned engineering firms or research universities. These information loops are broken and there are three root causes. First, the data doesn't match on the ground experience. As detailed in MIT's technology review, the processes that we use to make most of the world's machine learning models today, we can't tell if they're going to work in the real world or not. And that's because model data, whether it's about flooding or heat or air quality or wildfire risk, is lacking granularity and context. And that's leading to critical de design errors. So for example, rain um, level assumptions in Miami and New Orleans have been inaccurate and multi-million dollar HUD funded or bond funded infrastructure projects are either undersized or have been placed in the wrong locations. So I see change solves for that. Um, two, round truthing our model data and the things we need to verify data is, inex is expensive and insufficient. We can't have field engineers in the right places at the right times and even our sensors are easily broken or overwhelmed while video cameras are missing critical details and context. The IC change solves for that. And three, the data is not the only problem. If it was, we wouldn't be struggling with climate change in the first place. We are struggling with people and engaging people around climate risk and infrastructure. We're having workshops and meetings that nobody can go to because they have two jobs and they can't make it on the weekends. And we're making websites that nobody visits. And it's all eroding public trust and missing the most valuable insights that can be provided in partnership with our least resource community members and local community organizations. And that's exactly what IC Change is solving for. So IC Change is a climate data and engagement platform in one that is enabling municipalities, engineers, utilities, researchers, and nonprofits to collaborate directly with the public on solutions using community climate feedback loops. So we have a software as a service platform that is complementing in-person engagement. It's scaling that engagement and centralizing critical data insight, um, providing details and public trust that we need to respond to climate risk and public infrastructure solution. And we've done this many times across multiple climate risks. In federally funded infrastructure projects like this one in New Orleans, we quadrupled public participation. Residents tracked 29 flood events and proved that the models were underestimating their stormwater risk. We saved the engineering firm over half a million dollars in redesign fees and we reallocated $4.8 million in flood capacity to a low income neighborhood that wasn't receiving the infrastructure solutions it needed. And so what this means is that residents in St. Bernard neighborhood don't have to worry about losing their cars, which is their second, if not first, most valuable asset. The neighborhood is getting the largest stormwater underground unit, storage unit of its kind in the South. And this work has scaled. So we are the flood reporting tool for the city of Miami. And in the last three storm season, IC Change helped the city generate over $20 million in stormwater resilience investments in low income neighborhoods. So multiple departments are sharing the data in real time. Uh, DPW resilience uh, were used in the EOC during real time flood events. Last summer, we received the same number of reports as 911 during Hurricane Ian and PTC1. The city um, procured us uh, for, with a three year bid waiver. And this year we're expanding IC Change to Miami-Dade County, that's 34 municipalities, to track flooding, pollution, urban heat, and transit. We did a recent heat study, because uh, heat and flooding are related, of course, in our low-income neighborhoods, with the New Orleans Health Department and now Johns Hopkins University. And the data is suggesting that we need stronger safety and housing protections for low-income renters. And it might be a better tactic than some of our public greening efforts, keeping people safe in their homes. You all learned that this last winter with Yuri. So IC Change data was not only used to introduce the city's first cooling standard in its rental registry, we were able to lower the standard and limit the energy impacts to low-income homeowners. So we track more than flooding and heat. Um, our, we're used uh, to track air quality, trees, point source pollution, and other climate change impacts over time. Even the simplest IC Change posts generate a wealth of qualitative and quantitative information. Our platform is a real-time, geosocial, AI-enabled, and hyper-local data. We sync every post to local weather and sensor networks for additional layers of context and model validation. But at the end of the day, it's stories. It's stories that have changed infrastructure designs with as little as 1% of a target community participating. We like to say that a thousand dicey change users in the right places at the right time are the more are more impactful than a million Instagram users. And that's because, again, it's that technical data that is missing in our mitigation and our adaptation solution design. The 
other thing that happens is real-time response from local governments and partners, which incentivize citizens to continue providing their data and their stories and generating the trust needed to accelerate solutions. We see people going from saying, oh, the city never responds to, oh my gosh, thank you. I can't believe you guys responded so quickly. Um, and that is critical for generating trust. Uh, we're looking at using the base platform on IC change for energy efficiency and EVs and other clean energy solutions that can be implemented with community members. Again, to make sure that we're putting the right solutions in the right places to serve real community needs. Our customers and partners are growing across the country. Uh, we, are, uh, we do have an NSF SBIR grant this year to develop fusion modeling around qualitative and quantitative data, and we'd welcome collaboration from you all. Um, our bottom line, I think we had talked about asks and offers as part of our presentation. Our bottom line offer is IC Change as a scalable platform for you all at Planet tw um, Texas 2050 um, to enable bottom-up system change. Um, we're happy to gather qualitative and quantitative data at scale to unlock those resilience insights, validate models, and more equitably connect to your community. Um, and then our ask is to get in touch and to listen for ways we can work together. Um, I'd love to give you a demo of the client-side version of IC Change. I uh, didn't have time today to do that in five minutes or six minutes, I think. But you can go ahead and sign up for ICChange.com and document your URI story right now. Um, these stories um, are, you know, are critical uh, to understand and, and, and document. And IC Change is free for anyone anywhere in the world to use to create a community climate record. So uh, we appreciate I look forward to the conversation. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, and our last panelist, and then we'll open up for a broader discussion, um, Dave Miyogi. And thank you, Dave, about five minutes to speak about data and, and the new city climate office. Sure. Thank you. So uh, Julia talked about uh, pictures. Uh, previously, we had in the lightning talks people talking about arts and integration. And I asked about in you know, educational aspects. And I'll tell you a story why these pictures become so important and the whole issue about localization. We were doing this uh, project in Zimbabwe. And the Zimbabwe government was trying to develop a curriculum. And the students there really felt, thank you, I was hiding. Uh, <laughs> now I'm exposed. Oh. Uh, so the, uh, the general belief was that they were teaching climate change, but there was a disbelief of any action needed to be done. And it turned out that the examples that were put in the books were about polar bears and things happening with ice caps, which they could never relate to. So the issue was this was something that is happening there, not in my backyard. Yeah. And as you probably know, I mean, uh, coming up, we all heard about the stories. And I believe in the general goodness that people want to do good. They just don't have enough opportunities and enough tools. And one way we create those tools is by giving them data. And why is data so important at a scale that is relatable to action? Is because we lose memory of that event. Uh, things happen. We are in the middle of it. It is the most important thing that has happened. Then there's something called life takes over, and we forget. Policymakers and decision makers, when they're trying to develop those policies, they start looking for data. And guess who has that data? Resource-rich communities. What happens after that? Solutions come up in places where there's data, because you want to do it in a scientific manner without showing bias, without going into a mode where you might be letting your own perception do it. So in trying to develop a scientific way of solution, you are getting into a world where data dictates your future. And data is the king, yeah? Uh, so what we have been doing is going up with this framework of uh, creating memories. And uh, you probably heard of NIMBY, not in my backyard. I mean, that was the whole thing about the environmental movement. Don't put things in my backyard. What I'm saying is that the climate movement is all about SIMBI. I want climate in my backyard. I want this information right here. I don't care what happens. I do, but really speaking, what's happening miles and miles away, I want to know, is my city going to be, my neighborhood going to be? my street going to be something I can access with. And that's where we start working with this whole framework of SIMBI. It's great we have data from the airport. I don't live at the airport. So when you tell me that the change in the airport is your city's climate, I differ. And so we need to create information that is much more localized. 
And that is where we start bringing in the science, the technology, the community perceptions all together. How do we do that? We use something called mumbo jumbo. How do we do that? <laughs> so we start with this notion that climate change is here. It is not something distantly, it is not something hard. The climate solutions that we can come up with are also here. We know what to do. We just need different ways to do it. And one way of how we are going to do it is what I'm going to tell you about. And this is this response, the manner in which UT, City, all of us are putting our ideas together in creating the first ever City Climate Center collab, where we are putting the ideas from the researchers, from the city, all together, where we will be creating products, tools, assessments that are city specific. Because everything we heard about climate change is from global models. Everything we know about data is from national centers. We have a state climate office. We don't have state of Austin yet. So we need a climate office, which is for Austin. Yep, and that is where we are creating that. And so we are creating this ecosystem where we have people like Mark, who would be co-leading it from the city. Uh, Patrick, I, and Jungfeng, Jiav, uh, we will be helping it and putting our efforts from the UT side. So this is a true collaborative partnership between city, UT, and we already know it is a very successful model to work with because we get people like Jessica who can do these things and solve it. Yeah. So why is this important? So let's take back a step. There used to be a thing called Blockbuster. And if you were in 2000, this was the best thing you could do to go and actually get a video cassette that you actually watch a movie. And there used to be places you have to go and get a cassette and put it into a thing called VCR and actually watch a movie. This is the model that is still evident for climate information. <laughs> we have data, you come to us. Yeah, what we need to create is the Netflix version of climate and that is what we are creating. We give you the data, you use it, and we will develop the products and tools that are required. And did you say thank you? Thank you. <laughs> yes, she said time. thank you there, right? So catching up and, and just putting up on time, I would say, how are we doing this? We are developing maps, working with partnerships. We are creating AI, artificial intelligence, graphic tools, bringing all this augmented reality into a future world. You say, we don't experience climate. I say, welcome to the augmented world. You will experience climate change. That's what we should talk. Yeah, and then what we are doing is developing climate assessments, about pulling it down, what will happen in Austin in the future. And we have different projects going on, including a new one where we are going to reimagine I-35 and how it is going to be doing in terms of equity and climate and so forth. So all of this, we will put into this magic thing called a center and come up with energy and policy and solutions and together, we will come up with solutions locally. Thank you. Wow, thank you all so much. Um, we, we have permission from Heidi to go over a little bit, because we have a break right after this, which is great, because I know there's going to be lots of response and discussion. And we've got a full house of, of collaborators here in the room. Uh, Miriam, which question should we start out with for our panel? And I think. When y'all speak, just say your names and uh, a little brief two-sentence background about what you do and where you came from. So let's start with relationships. So one of the most common barriers that we see within all of our work is relationships. How do you see your, the role of relationships, personal, communal, um, institutional, contributing to the outcomes of our em emergency response or saving people's lives. Janice? Um, Janice Bookout. I am a co-founder of a multiracial collaborative focused on offsetting the inequities in disaster response. Um, and I'm also the director of Earth Day Austin. And um, first I wanna start by just saying my eight-year-old, like I'm gonna let, her speak for a second. I love you, and I want, I really do, and I want each of you to have the most extraordinary experience of life and access to that exquisite experience, like the, you know, that experience you've had where you just have pure joy and nothing else. That's not 
we don't have equal access to that, and that's not okay with me. Um, so that's where my relationships begin, is with that eight-year-old, and when I honor her, like I've lived in the gap, developing myself in that domain my entire life. I've done a lot of really bizarre things. Um, but all consistent with that. And um, so when we started Community Resilience Trust, it was two days after we canceled the festival, which was pretty heartbreaking to do at the time. But, it's, but it was just mor it was miraculous, really. Um, Ruben Cantu and myself started it. We met every day for uh, two years, 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. every single day with about 20 to 30 organizations represented with individuals. And we very quickly emerged into a model. We were committed to being anti-racist. So members of the global majority spoke first. White people listened first. That also then kind of evolved into people with the lived experience of the topic being discussed, which was typically still anti-racist plus lived experience. So for example, everybody has a lived experience. Mine includes operating on a low income for a five year period of time. It's tough. And it also includes being the mother of you know musicians and a, a, a child on the autism spectrum. So um, as we listened to each other, we would, for half an hour, we would, we would um, start with updates and requests, like we would start with updates and requests for support and intentions. And then the second half hour, we called it workshop time. And we would workshop together on the pan on pandemic impacts. So we did, that evolved into multiple spin-off collaborative projects. So the Maternal Health Equity Collaborative. The, um, we had a formula shortage collaborative. We did a lot of work advising the city on what to do next um, in relationship to the pandemic. Because we had, we had boots on ground folks in the same room as researchers, right? And the director of natural sciences at Houston Tillotson University. We, did um, infographics together. We had a project on um, the unhoused, uh, unhoused community. We had a project involving, um, and, and then we got into Storm Uri. And so when we, when Storm Uri started, um, one of our groups, one of our partners, uh, in Austin Area Urban League expressed a concern about the unhoused community a few days out. Within two days, we had a 24 seven Zoom room open um, to address what we were missing, where the gaps are. And we had formed those relationships and we built more in those spaces, but what basically in relationship to each other, we asked the question of who's being left out with a commitment that no one be left out. But it started with listening to the perspective and valuing the perspective of the other person in the room. So one of the ways that institutions fail and institutions predictably fail during disaster response, and at the same time they have, there's a lot of strengths there, okay, which I do not want to discount. But the way that institutions predictably fail is that it doesn't take into account the real world on the ground experience of individuals. And those individuals will not tell institutions in the moment, A, there's no access, B, there's no trust. So you create a trusted collaborative space where your voice is valued and you can say why that communication didn't work for you or what you need to know to actually save your children in the moment. And I'm listening to you and then others are listening to you and we're saying, oh my God, you're right. Like, you know, Austin's colony hasn't had water for five days. That's where we need to send water first. And then we're connected to the city and all the city's resources and it becomes a very human, vibrant, uh, real-time, iterative, disruptive experience. And the last thing I'll say about that is together, what we're also doing in that moment is we're taking a crowbar and we're widening the cracks that show up in, this, in the systemic response. So systemic racism, you can start to see those cracks during disasters, so disasters become this iterative opportunity to keep improving the system with every disaster. So the worse it gets, the better it gets. And that's, that's the vision. Um, I think that's enough. Thank you, Janice. Anybody else want to reply to relationships, roles and relationships? Mia? Uh, one of the things that our organization, Community Coalition for Health, we call ourselves relationship brokers. 
because um, we are, I, I, I love the boots on the ground, but I call it toes in the grass, which <laughs> means we have to really get in there. We got to dig deep. We got to talk to the people. We have to make sure that they know we understand them and that they know that we care. And one of the things that organizations first, 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 is what do you want from us instead of we got this for you, take it or leave it. Because a lot of times, if you give people a million dollars and that ain't what they ask for, they'll say keep it. So, um, and, and that's a fact. Uh, if you go to Austin Colony, actually Austin Colony is one of my, one of our um, areas that we, that we have infiltrated or they've become our community or we've become their community, one or the other. But um, there's been things that's offered to them and they're like, we didn't ask you for that. So even though the data shows they need it, they said we need this first. So I think that like, like um, the professor said, we need, it, we need a combination of relationship, data, trust, because without a relationship, you can't love on me. Like the eight-year-old said, I ain't gonna let you love on me if you don't have a relationship with me. Thank you, Patrick. Hello. Yeah. So, uh, Patrick Bixler, I'm a faculty at the OBJ School of Public Affairs, and I've just spent um, kind of from, I guess, both the academic and the practice perspective, spent a lot of time thinking about um, I exactly that, and, and really how can we, how do we build the types of relationships that are needed to connect the research to the community groups, to the residents, and have a bi-directional flow of information. And I think it's, it's um, yeah, just kind of, I, I relationships underpin community resilience uh, in both the community, but also how we understand and conceptualize and um, <coughs> articulate the science of community resilience. And I just think building those partnerships and those relationships is so critical. Thanks, Patrick. I think Julia um, had a comment? Or would you yeah, make, like to make a comment? <laughs> I'm sure, sure, thank you, yeah. I was just following up on both Mia and Patrick um, just to, to underscore that. Um, so we are following up uh, with some of our partners in, in Miami this week, um, and across a lot of our, our, our applications, we have our cities or utilities who are interested in focusing on flooding projects or flooding infrastructure or electric vehicles, but we're seeing from the community's perspective their stories and their concerns about trash. Now, trash is actually critical to our flooding uh, risk and really creating a culture around that and knowing that that is actually what the community cares about first. Um, empty lots in their neighborhoods that they feel are abandoned and don't make them feel abandoned and that those are more important to them than any kind of infrastructure bill coming or any kind of big dollar sign. Um, so really being able to match those priorities um, with the needs and underscoring those relationships between what we're seeing and what we care about to opportunities to, to develop projects um, a lot of our communities in Chicago are talking about, hey, you know, we these electric vehicle churches are all well and good, but we're really concerned about air pollution, and we're really concerned about pollution in our neighborhoods, and being able to connect the dots between this particular solution and and their concern. Um, so when you start to see that those stories popping up on IC Change, our city partners or our research partners are able to go in with a community first mindset about how to combine these conversations into better results for everybody. Um, so I really, um, I applied a lot of the, the conversation that's happening right now. It's, it's critical to, to set the bar. Thank you. Anybody else wanna, or Mark? <laughs> Give me the eye. Um, <laughs> Hey everybody, my name is Mark Couder. I'm with the Office of Resilience. I work with Jessica. Um, back in April, so 11 months ago, the city hired on a Chief Resilience Officer. Uh, former Deputy Chief Resilience Officer for Houston and now the Chief Resilience Officer for Austin. No budget, no staff. So you're essentially telling this person you're an advisor, you're not an officer. So. When you talk about relationships, you know, it becomes really, really hard because you, without a budget, and without any kind of resources, you're sort of stuck with your charisma. You're, I mean, like, so I, 
work with the Office of Sustainability. I'm on loan to the Office of Resilience because she had no staff and we had to get creative. We brought Jess on like six months later. We brought on a guy named Ted in on Halloween. So he's been with us for the three months through a Fuse Fellow. So this is external funding. We're just trying to get people, trying to get funding, trying to get relationships going. I can't, we can't do this without relationships. Like we're just sitting in a room by ourselves watching YouTube videos and until we have some kind of relationship. So we need people like Patrick to sort of help us understand social vulnerability. We need the enthusiasm of Dave to, to create the UT Climate City Lab Center. Uh, but we really, really need voices from the community like Mia, like Janice, like uh, Miriam. Because without that, we're nothing or we're making wrong decisions. We do have people within the city we can talk to, but we've learned through history that we can't depend on the city to make decisions that'll p keep people safe. So we need relationships and they have to be with the right people telling us the right things. Thank you, Mark. And the other, I think that was all right. Catherine, do we wanna go into our next question? Or do? Oh yeah, totally. Do y'all have any questions? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can go a little past. We have about 10 minutes. Maybe we'll take some audience questions and a little back and forth. Q&A, we can take that. Mm -hmm. right. Hi. Um, my name is Shania, and I'm currently a senior in um, the Walker Department of Mechanical Engineering, and I'm doing my BDP in Design Strategies. Um, for one of my um, independent studies, we're actually um, researching about uh, resilience, especially within natural disasters. And I think one question that's always stumped me is um, whenever you are in, I guess, situations of disaster, um, I know how would preparedness versus human instinct, those are like the two things that I kind of struggle whenever you're in mom moments of crisis. Um, you can prepare all you want, but when something strikes you, I know the human emotions kind of just hit the ground running. So um, I guess that's kind of my question for everybody in this panel. Um, how do you guys kind of make decisions um, within those two spheres? Um, so I do a lot of, I don't know if this is trauma and trauma or not, right? But I do a lot of anticipating, a lot of anticipatory strategy. So for example, today, six to 9 p.m., there'll be tornadic winds. I'm, I'm often also thinking from community perspective, right? And who's being left out. So as you go home today, if you see an encampment, if you pass an encampment, my request would be stop and let them know that there's going to be tornadic winds. Their tents may be destroyed and they can take some actions to protect themselves. There will be no shelter tonight. That's an example. Um, for, for me, an example is a great leader. Um, in Yuri, we had a great leader who took on the responsibility of maybe 100 to 120 families. And the instincts of some of us was, I'm gonna hunker down. But the same people in the community who didn't have a great leader hunkered down and didn't wake up. So um, I always say that the person that's the biggest leader is not the person that's voted in by votes or at the poll. It's the person that's voted in by the community and the people in that community. I'll just say that uh, two things. One is this, if you look at the doctors in ER, which is the emergency room, there are things we can learn from them how to deal with emergencies in a natural setting. And one thing is to have set of protocols that are in place. Uh, we heard from one of our wonderful playwright about even though you may have the nature of being stoic and resilient, you may not be able to nurture that in the events of emergencies, right? And so you need to have a process in play. Now, it, at an individual level, institutional level, city level, we need to have processes in play. 
And so when there is a winter storm, or whether we are going to create a new policy for homeowners to have a building code which requires you to winterize it, rather than you know having burst pipes every time after temperature falls below 32, that will be a policy. And that would need some sort of a steps in place. So I would go with the process that what is really required is well-crafted, well-researched <coughs> checklists. And those, if are used and then made more popular, then perhaps we have a better resilience. And then I'll just add, uh, we're working on creating a neighborhood emergency preparedness training from the city side. And this stems from a co-creation with community in the 78744 zip code where we co-created with university and community partners an emergency preparedness guide and really trying to translate all the information about preparedness, about what should go in a kit, about tips on how to prepare for a power outage versus heat waves, turning that into just usable on the ground information, sound bites that are easy to understand. I feel like that's the hardest barrier with preparedness is all that information is so jargony and overly technical. And you look at even the emergency texts and emails that we're getting today, um, the voicemails, uh, they're overly jargony, they're hard to understand, and a lot of times it's hard to translate that information into personal action. And so we're looking at trying to make that information more usable and more relatable, and also turn the guide, which is like a big encyclopedia of everything, important phone numbers to websites to apps, to um, a train the trainer model, a deck that can someday, like you and I could pull it up, we could train our friends, we could train our neighbors, and we would have the power of that information in our hands. I also would like to add that, like during Yuri, hopping into CRT Zoom room, I didn't know what preparedness was. All I had was my human instinct and what I've learned within being a community member. And so I think they go hand in hand, but, and all you can, when, when they go hand in hand, but, when you don't know what preparedness is, especially like for tornadic winds, how do you prepare for that? I don't know. I mean, like, like for unsheltered people, like what do we do for them? What can we, like what can we ask them what they need help with? We can ask them the question of what they need and then we can come together and brainstorm, right? How we help them and, but the, the need comes from the community that is, um, the ones that are in need. So yeah, I think it's it's the brainstorming and connecting and those relationships that then get you into preparedness from human instinct and using each other's human instinct as that energy to create positive preparedness. If I can just say one more thing. Based on what you just said, just real quick, um, the other part of that, and I think why I s answered the way that I did is because we're always alone, right? And that the fear comes from, like you're isolated in your experience, but then you're not alone. Like even in even with this the storm coming today, th we're all a resource. Like this room, if you all literally leave and on your way home, because you probably live all over town, on your way home, if you honor the request I made, then we're actually serving a lot of people that would otherwise not be served and making a connection to other human beings that we have a chance to connect to. And I would chime in that um, I love the example of you, you know, reaching out to, um, with something that you see every day that you know is a vulnerability that during an extreme event becomes a point of crisis. And I think that's one of the things that I would encourage everyone when it comes to resilience is that it's the things that are minor today or that you see every day that you need to pick that are probably the flashpoints during an, an intense storm. So that um, area that has a persistent puddle today becomes a, a big flood moment later during an event. During um, a windstorm, um, you know, it was actually folks in Canada, we did their climate adaptation plan and their city wanted to focus on flooding and heat. Those are the most expensive and the most deadly climate impacts. And yet residents are telling us, and I see change, that they were cutting down their trees because they were afraid that they would fall in their houses. And it had been happening more and more. And there's a reason for that. There's, they've been going through frozen, freeze and thaw cycles that are making tree roots a little bit less stable. But by paying attention to that, they were actually paying attention to something very, very important. 
that later uh, when we <laughs> finished Slam, a derecho hit that town and they lost so many trees and so many power lines and much more than they had anticipated. So your instinct is right. Human instinct is a, is a really power, powerful tool. We've been evolved from thousands and thousands and thousands of years to, to, to detect where we're vulnerable, where there is risk. But paying attention to it and honoring it is, is how we can help and, and stay safe and, and feel protective. Our neighbors are our first responders. So a lot of the communities that we work with where, where those neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor interactions aren't strong, those are the ones that I worry about. Um, it's in, in, and, in, and those are the folks that you depend on. So if those unhoused people who are living with um, homelessness in your neighborhood, those are your neighbors. Um, so I, I really love the conversation and, 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 and these I do. I think it's an interesting question of preparedness versus natural instinct. In emergency management world, it would be wonderful if it was muscle memory that you knew exactly what to do in an emergency. You grabbed your bag, you have all your stuff in it, all your papers, you do what you gotta do and you get it done. That is slightly depressing. Imagine a world where you didn't have to do that. <clears throat> Imagine all the people who live in houses that are insulated and they don't have to worry about cold weather. All the people who live in insulated houses don't have to worry about cold, warm weather. People who have a substantial amount of drugs, they need to survive, they have them stored, like they have all that stuff at home. Imagine if you could just stay at home and you'd be safe. So I agree that um, we have to be thinking about preparedness, but I don't want it to be the end all be all. I don't want it to be the answer. I want it to be you know, part of the discussion, but I'd much rather people be safe at home. Dr. Banks, did I see your hand up earlier? No, sorry. <laughs> I was thinking about how intentional Heidi and Jonathan were with today's agenda. I was just trying to think about wrapping it back up to this morning. Um, we have time for one last question or comment from the audience. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Uh, just one question. I think this might be directed toward Mia. I'm sorry, what is your name again on the end? Janice and um, possibly Jessica. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about, and maybe even Deb too, maybe. Um, let me know. Um, I've been thinking a lot about uh, access to resource, right? Um, and the stigma and shame that is also connected around access to resource, especially in a state like Texas, um, where public resources and always, where, where our views of public resource and who should be accessing them um, come with a lot of shame. Uh, I'm also thinking a little bit about what I noticed in communities of color when it came to COVID vaccination, right? And who was accessing uh, the, the vaccinations within communities as color, of color as well. So I'm thinking a little bit about um, how you plan on, I guess my question is how do you plan on uh, combating those, that type of stigma uh, so that folks feel ready to access the resources that these, um, that these resource hubs uh, are providing? That's a wonderful question. And actually, we were in the back in the corner kind of whispering about it um, earlier today. Um, one of the things that we found during COVID is that hoarding mentality. Um, not only the hoarding mentality, but also I tell people all the time, my name is Mia, Mia Christian Greer. And on, a, um, on paperwork, and you look at my email, you have no idea unless you see my picture who I am, whether I'm black or white or Hispanic, because I talk from the north. So I get emails and calls and things that La Mia or Camilla Jackson may not have gotten. So during COVID, I got calls on where you could go on the east side because the east side people aren't getting in line to get your COVID shot without having the specific criteria and nobody will ask you a question. Mm -hmm. That came to Mia, Christian Greer, not La Mia. So what we ended up doing is every time I got something like that, I would get the Hispanic churches, the Hispanic groups, I would get the black churches, black groups, and say, go right over there, right now. And if they turn you away, call me. Mm -hmm. West Side, West Side had 24 hours, seven days a week, of COVID shots. East side was from two to three or two to four, three days a week. 
we had to fight and fight and fight and not let them decide that we were not, we, we were begging to be saved from this COVID. That's what we felt. I'll say we, I don't live in the community, but I fight for the community, that we had to fight to live and they had to uh, just live, live to live another day. So it is very, 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 very hard. Even to the point where the, um, the water shortage, there, it's like the West Side gets cleaned up, best of the best, and then we'll get to you. And I am one of the people that says, you better get over there right now before I call the news, before I make a big fuss, before me and my team get out there and start going off. Um, we have a hard time, and, and, and us minorities, we're proud people. So you're right, if we're standing in line trying to get food and people are rolling their eyes, well, we need it. We need it. Because of how prideful we are, we, it takes a lot for us to get in line for help. It takes a lot. We don't want to. I'd rather call my mama if she was here than get in a line for some food. But sometimes we have to do it. And as a community, as, as all of you in here, we, black people and Hispanics, and we don't want a handout. I remember being in a meeting and a, and a young man said, I just want what they got. Nothing more, nothing less. I just want what they got. And I thought that was a fair statement. I would say from a Resilience Hub uh, programming wise, so we're looking at not creating programs and resources for community, but we're working on having community create and co-create and invite them to the space to tell us what they need. And I think that's a really new approach for a city to take. Um, it's a really like uncomfortable space. It's a new space. It's a space that will take longer than a, a grant reporting period, right? Um, and it's a navigating who needs to be around the table who's not around the table that we can invite in and how do we get them to the table, right? And so uh, looking at really shaping our next phase of the community engagement to have community leaders like Mia, like Miriam, and faces that are trusted in the community to help lead this effort rather than our faces where we don't live in the neighborhoods, uh, we're not at these regular community events so they wouldn't know us and why would they want to come and tell us what they would want or need. Um, so really working again on building that community trust. I would just, on the shoulders of that, and especially me, me on what you said, like um, working from listening to each other, listening to that, but then not just listening, listening and make it, making it real for myself, and then asking myself, what can I impact operationally to be in alignment with what's actually wanted and, and, and needed and available, right? Um, so two examples. One is um, one of our collaborative spaces that CRT leads is, uh, uh, actually opens and facilitates, it, it leads itself, is a, a vaccine collaborative, which includes um, African American Youth Harvest Foundation, Latino Healthcare Forum is in that space or has been, um, Communication for the Deaf, Age of Central Texas, and what we did together, and this was originally funded through Saint, uh, through United Way from St. David's, and then it evolved over time, and we're still, we're still running it. Um, but we looked at, uh, together, we had conversations, but we also added data to that, and we started looking at intersectional, disaggregated, zip code level data to ask the question, what is actually, how is the vaccine actually getting distributed? Because this narrative of, of hesitancy was not it, we didn't buy that. And so, um, and so we started saying things at uh, going and advocating it, it uh, you know, in uh, front of commissioner's court and saying things like, don't say that we're at 70% until we're at 70% in every zip code. That's how that one translated. Another example is, um, you know, the traditional model for resource allocation. So, you know, distinguishing again, what, where have we not operationalized equity? So the traditional model for disaster response um, has like sanctioned organizations that are predominantly white-led 
and predominantly Christian, which they do great work, but it's limited. And the relation, and it's through a, a program that's federally sanctioned called COAD or VOAD, it used to be VOAD, Volunteer, uh, um, Volunteer Organizations Active in Disasters. And there is funding priority that comes with that. There's funding opportunities. There's all kinds of things like in access. It's a gate that's open that a lot of CBOs and grassroots groups and just neighbors that are doing good work and for their neighborhood don't know about. And so, um, you know, what, what, what I've really appreciated about several of our city offices, and I want to say this out loud because they're, some of them are here, right? This resilience office, the sustainability office, um, equity office, um, homeless strategy division, uh, and also the EOC over the last three years have really listened and opened the uh, open lines of communication, come to some of our calls, invited us to their space to sort of bridge those gaps and start to create other ways for those resources to flow and it's working. And information and resources, right? So we're intentionally disrupting and shifting the way in which inequity has become operationalized and turning and then operationalizing equity and do just doing the work. Thank you. Um, so with that, I'm gonna wrap this up and wanna say thank you to everybody on this panel. And um, also thank you, Heidi, and to Planet Texas 2050. And I wanna say that But also response, recovery, and relief, it takes us all. And on a riff of the goddess RuPaul, if you don't take care of yourself, how the hell are you gonna take care of somebody else? Oh. <laughs>